Oh, Steve, how are you? Okay, you're PH2? I am, yes. <laughs> but I, I'm a Stefan. I know, I should have been a Stefan. But I was, <laughs> but I wasn't. I lost that. You know, it's, you know, it's so, it's never too late to change. If you're a PH, you can just, it's so phonetically ambiguous. You can say, I'm a Stefan now. And uh, Listen, I have spent really half my life correcting Blue Stein, so I'm not going to have to now start correcting both of them. <laughs> yes, that's very true. I feel, do you get, uh, when people see the name, do they say Stefan first or, or Steven? Okay. No, I usually just go by Steve. Okay, smart. That's smart. Maybe I should just go by Steph. Then people get yeah, that's cool. Stephen. That's a cool Steph. Yeah. Um, but so I what do you go ahead. do beside this podcast? Are you a comedian? Are you a writer? That is a good question. I am a digital marketer. So I really? work I for a <laughs> I happy to help. Happy to help. I um yeah, I help um, companies show up in Google when people are searching for them, finding the right keywords and things like I, that. I have four books out and they have like one just got 24 five stars. Another one's got 98 five stars. The latest one is out three weeks. It's got 29 five stars. And, uh, you know, just can't cross mm. over the to the, you know, mega, mega sales. They get, you know, five book, 10 a week. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and so where are you? You're in Indiana? No, Chicago? Uh, Phoenix. Oh, Phoenix. Oh, Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm so it's sorry. <laughs> you know what right now it's okay with this freezing 60 degree weather but uh i used well, to live I, in new york city oh i love new i miss it so much i miss it so much i can't begin to tell you how much but i live just outside of palm springs and the funny thing is i'd be driving around and i'd see and it would be like 120 degrees out and i'd see plates from arizona around here and i'd say how hot must it be in arizona if they're coming here to cool off <laughs> oh very hot indeed i we moved here two years ago and i'm originally from arizona so i was used to the heat then we went to the east coast for about eight years and then moved back here and last summer was brutal it's like a hundred yeah, it didn't that's the summer i but... moved out here to move to the desert. Oh, wow. It was 116 oh, the day we moved in. Two movers fainted. Oh my gosh. They're carrying furniture in and I got, I have a, a, a mover in the bedroom fanning him <laughs> because he's lying on the floor. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, oh my gosh. Me. Yeah, so we ended up. New York? Yeah, yeah. So my wife and I, we were living, we I, I lied, we actually we lived in New Jersey, but we both worked in Manhattan. So I say New York to sound cooler. Oh, that's, that's, that's a commute I don't want with an hour a day each way. It was it was only half an hour. We lived in near Newark. So it wasn't too bad of a commute. No. Oh, I see. Newark, Phoenix without the heat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> oh, I like that. You know, I, I like that's I, nice. I used to do this. I used to do this joke in my act, and I would say the, the plane landed. The captain said, uh, "Ladies and gentlemen, we've just landed in Newark, New Jersey, and I'm so sorry." <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, we uh, when we first moved there, we were gonna live in the city. And then we looked at the rent prices. We're like, all right, they're, I guess. They've just they've plummeted now. You should go back now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Probably because of the pandemic, right? Now the prices are mm -hmm. cheap. Oh. Free rent for two months. No down, no deposits. Yeah. 
I lived on 58th Street between second and third. And, oh, uh, nice. and, and my apartment was so small. How small was it? If the toilet, if the toilet seat was down, you couldn't close the bathroom door. That's how small it was. Oh my God. I, that's how not a joke. You? That's real. That's real. <laughs> how long did you live in that apartment for? Uh, uh, about two years, two years. And then I came out to California. Are we recording any of this? We are, yes. We are. Oh, good. Uh, uh, I came out to California uh, to visit a friend. And I, I, I drove around Hollywood and I said, I, I feel like I've lived here all my life. And that was the truth. It was like I, maybe in a second lifetime I had lived here. And huh. I went back to New York. I sold my apartment. I sold the furniture. I came out with wow. one trunk and a nine inch television and a dog. And I got here on a Wednesday. I found an apartment on a Thursday. I got a job on a Friday. And I said to myself, well, the God must be telling me this is where I belong. And I've been here ever uh, since. Yeah. I was going to say, I couldn't wait to hear what happened Saturday with all that stuff happening. <laughs> <laughs> that wow! Man had a stroke. No. <laughs> that's that's a, oh, yeah. I, and I was gonna say too, because you were born in Boston. You went to Emerson College, right. then moved to New York, right. then L.A. or California. Right. Then to L.A. Uh, and that's where wow. I've been ever since. I used to joke that when I graduated Emerson, I threw my cap up in the air, and by the time it hit the ground, I was in New York. That's how. That's how much I wanted to get out of Boston. Wow. I, I can understand that. I love New York. I yeah, don't I know mean, Boston too well, but. Boston's a great city if you are in college. It's a great college town. There's like, you know, 800 colleges there. And so there's always something to do and it's cultural and everything. But after that, it's. You know, you just spend the rest of your life looking for an R. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, it, this is definitely not my joke, but somebody said all the movies about Boston are about people trying to get out of it. Yeah, so, it's the truth. I mean, the, the, the lower class Boston, and that's where I grew up in a city called Chelsea, Mass., which, you mm -hmm. know, the hub of the pandemic in Boston right now. Um, oh, it, no. it, it was, it was the kind of town that either it bonded you forever, or it it bar it uh, marred you forever. And for mm. me, it bonded me to marring. You know, I was like, I have lots of friends there who I adore to this day, uh, like family, and uh -huh. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I could not wait to get out of there. You know, oh, and, and when I, and the funny thing is. When, you know, I went to Emerson, so for three years, I learned how to lose my Boston accent. And I go home, and I'm home 15 minutes. I mean the 15 minutes, and it's like, hey, Marlene, how are you? Your father's over here. We're talking on the phone. Yeah, come on, sit down. <laughs> it, it's so true. You know, and, and Fred Willard's wife, Mary, she's, she was uh -huh. awesome. She was also from Boston. And, and we used to joke because she said she was in Boston and she got off the plane and she heard the, fo the following conversation. She said, I didn't say you were an asshole. I said, your father was an asshole. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And it's so <laughs> funny. I was going to ask too about the accent because you're everything I've seen you on, your accent is so neutral. It sounds like well, you're from California. I learned, or from here. I learned that at Emerson, general American speech. Uh, but, but mm. I, you know, I, I had a really thick Boston lower income accent and it took me years mm. of saying, how oh, now brown car. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, bro! Car and using your overly open voice uh, to to learn, and then after a while, it and they said it would take about three years, and then it would just become 
subconscious. You would just do it without even thinking about it because when you're trying to change the accent, you're constantly thinking about it. And, mm. and over, over the years, it suddenly just becomes natural and, and you no longer. But now I, when I hear it, I mean, I never heard the accent before, but now when yeah. I hear it, it's like, oh, <laughs> oh God, ah, that's, that's so funny. I, I miss it. I, the, not necessarily the Boston accent, but the New York and New Jersey accents. Oh, it's yeah. like oh. crowded, that, polluted music to my ears. I love hearing you know, I'm like be, Comedians are like sponges, you know, we, we just suck up everything. And I was in New York and I was talking like this in about 20 minutes. <laughs> yes, I'm from Queens and Rigo Park. <laughs> sit, down, sit down, we'll talk, you know. <laughs> my friends they would make fun of me for the way that i said water because everybody says water over water. In, in jersey water. at least yeah, water. water yeah water. so i started saying it and then they they're like yeah finally you're starting to catch on I, and so yeah, you know. it's it's water and in boston it's water with water <laughs> water with the d but it, uh, it is potatoes tomatoes and water <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love it. But I, I was going to ask, I mean, well, first off, hello, everybody listening. This is a comedy advice podcast with me, Stefan Satani, and special guest, Steve Bluestein, that you've been hearing interchange between Boston and New York and the neutral American accent. Um, Steve, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast, first off. Oh, it's a pleasure to be had. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> at this stage, Walt, I'll go to a supermarket opening. I'm not proud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I mean, you have been funny for more years than I've probably been alive. I mean, well, thank you. I, <laughs> thank I, you. I, I want to slap you. <laughs> <laughs> I know after I said it, I was like that's I don't know if that's a compliment but yeah. uh, didn't you I'm very like young. for Moses <laughs> <laughs> I'm only 17 years old so it's okay but are you uh, only 17 no no just turned oh. 18 last month no I'm kidding I'm kidding I oh, yeah. I'm 32 oh all right all right yeah yeah so I need a haircut there. so uh <laughs> <laughs> very badly we, is that the pandemic hair it is yes i i had it very nice i usually have it shaved on the sides and then uh -huh. a little much shorter but a, a nice little cleaned up uh well right now the... it's very 70s so it's 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 very in you know and i had mine sh got really short and it's growing now and i'm just uh i used to have somebody come to the house to cut my hair but i'm afraid you know to have anyone come to the house now see that's me too and i remember i was watching one of your clips i think it was on the norm crosby show and i was looking at the audience and i was looking i was like oh i gotta look like those guys all i need is the mustache that was the 70s or the 80s i guess it was more like the 80s, it was the 80s. yeah and yeah just, yeah yeah we just lost norm he was a wonderful guy wonderful mm. guy Oh man. I was going to ask yeah. too. I, I had read that you had started to get into comedy, the bug bitch ya after college in Boston, when you went to New York and um, getting into improv. No, I'm wrong. No, Sorry. You're wrong. I went, I, this is what happened. I went from college to New York city to become yeah. a singer, to become a singer. And I was working in the, the village and you know doing open night mics in the village and then uh -huh. you know i started starving so i had to get a job so i went to alexander's department store as a, to get a job as a salesman and they kept uh -huh. promoting me then i was assistant manager then i was manager then i was divisional manager and then i ended up in the buying office i never wanted any of that and i was miserable beyond words but i was making money so i i you know and then when i went to california on a, uh i went to california to to visit my dear friend ian siebert who just passed away uh about mm. three months ago and he was like a brother to me mm -hmm. and i went out to visit him and i felt well this is where i belong 
So I came out here with no job and no place to stay and everything just fell into, in, and that's, and then I was living in an apartment wow. building. I was living in an apartment building and I would always be making everybody laugh around the pool. And Dave Madden lived in the building and he was, uh, he was Reuben on the Partridge family. He was the manager on the Partridge family. And he said to me, you know, there's a new club that just opened called the Comedy Store. You should go there. And sitting on the other side of me was Albert Hammond. And Albert was a, a, an English si a songwriter that had been brought to America to write songs. And Albert said, he's right, you should do this. So Albert Hammond, and Dave Madden brought me to the comedy store for the first time. And I walked in and I sat in the audience and I watched the guys on stage. And I said, yeah, I could do that. I've been doing this all my life, you know? And so huh. I went out uh, the next week I had, you know, I had all these routines I was doing in college. And mm -hmm. I, I went to the comedy store and I did them on stage. And people laughed and Sammy Shore came up to me and he said, you keep coming back. You keep coming back because you have the sound. You have the sound. And so huh. because he said that, I came back and I lost my job at the May Company. And I became one of the original comics that at the comedy store. Me, uh, Tom Dreesen, George Miller, Jeff Altman, Elaine Boozler, uh, uh, Gary Muldeer. You know the the whole crew. We were the we were the original crew that started at the comedy store. Yeah, so that's how I got into wow. it. Wow. Yeah. What a way to get into it. That's it, that's amazing. And, and Albert, here's an interesting story. Albert lived downstairs from me, and uh, I was down in his apartment. It was January. It was pouring in in uh, California, and. He said, man, mm -hmm. this weather's awful. And I said, you know, it never rains in Southern California, but when it does, it pours. And the next day, well, it never rains in Southern California. <laughs> oh, wow. That's yeah. awesome. I was oh, actually man. at the recording session for that song. Uh, it, ne it never rains in Southern California. Yeah. Oh, wow. A, a comedian, writer, and muse. This is yeah, well, amazing. It was, and, and Albert, you know, then, then, you know, our lives went like this. You know, Albert went on tour and I went on tour. And we didn't see each other for 35 years. 35 years. And wow. we, he, I had been looking for him. And finally, when the internet came, I, I found him. And he lived like I had been driving by his house every day from my house. That's how close we live. And wow. we, we sat and he talked and he threw his arms around me and he said, you did it. You did it, you know? And I said, I Aww. know, I wouldn't have done it without you. I wouldn't have done it. And, and, and um, so Albert has uh, gone on to be indicted, indicted, in, inducted into the songwriters hall of fame he's got an emmy he's a world he he's huge in europe huge a superstar and you're and traveling mm -hmm. all the time and, and touring all the time so uh, mm -hmm. I, I i've made some really wonderful friends over the years oh my gosh that's incredible and i i also know that as you how long were you frequenting the comedy store before you founded groundlings uh, I, well, that first year that I went to the comedy store, uh, I, I, Valerie Curtin was there. Valerie uh, is an actress mm -hmm. and a writer. And I said to her, do you know if there are any classes that I could, and she said, Gary Austin is starting a class. Now, Gary ah. was one of the four original comedy store players, the improv group. So I went up to Gary and I said, hey, can I join your class? I mean, I literally, it was the second week I was there at the comedy store. He said, sure. Wow. He said, sure. And that class became the Groundlings. 
that class had Lorraine Newman and myself and Cindy Williams and, and Candy Clark and uh, Randy Kirby. And we were all in this class together. And I was in the very first show that they did. And that show later was the basis for what the Groundlings do now every, every Saturday, you know, the, the Saturday or the Sunday company. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And I'm just noticing, I have no hair in this shot. <laughs> the dark <background. laughs> like my head stops right here. <laughs> you know what? I'll fix that in post. I'll paint it green or something. All right, so it stands thanks. out. I need that. <laughs> so yeah, so and then I, I you know, I, 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 uh, um, I did stand up for all those years, and then I wrote for television because I, I couldn't take the road anymore. I just mm -hmm. couldn't take it anymore. And when I started, there were like, you know, maybe 70 comics. By the time mm -hmm. I had gotten out, there were like 7,000. Now there's 70,000. You know, everybody, oh, yeah. everybody's a comedian. My housekeeper can do five minutes. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, a funny thing happened on the way from the vacuum. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, 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 it was, it was an art form when I started, and then it just, it just uh -huh. developed into you know crap. So I got out because wow. I'm sick of being on the road. And I started writing. I wrote for television for years. You know, I wrote variety and sitcom. And then when I was done, I, I started writing plays. So I wrote seven plays. And then when that was done, I wrote books. That's why we're here tonight. We're selling books, people. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. And they're going to be all links in the show notes. So if you guys want to click oh, on it, you can just click there. Yeah. And, uh, and Queen of Pines is the latest book. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a story about, uh, I had a really bad childhood, a really dysfunctional family and divorce and violence. And it was awful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was this place in Boston called Point of Pines, it, uh, which is by the sea. And there was a group of people there who adopted me uh, in terms of being like a, a surrogate family. And they taught me what love was all about. And so I wrote this wow. book to sort of honor them. And it's only been out, I think, two or three weeks. And it's got 20, did I say 29? It's got 29 five stars. It does. 29 yeah. five stars. Yeah. So oh, happy. that's incredible. That's incredible. And, and how long did it take to write that book? Because I'm sure that first off with drudging up bad memories, I'm sure that's never a fun thing to do. Oh, and uh, then pandemic book, pandemic book. No. All right, what am I going to do now? All right, I'll write a book. Literally, I was stuck in the house with nothing to do. I would get up every morning at about 6am. I'd write for three hours. Then I rewrite in the afternoon, and it took me about two months, and got it all down. So I think it's, I think it's forty nine thousand words. So, wow. um, yeah, and that's amazing. It was cathartic. It was really cathartic, and it was something I wanted to do. I wanted to honor those people because I love them. They're all gone now, but I, I love them a lot. Oh, that's and, beautiful. Yeah, and, and I also uh, I also thought of it as a movie, but and I sent it I've sent it around, and I've got some really wonderful feedback. But you know, the business is so insane anymore. It's just I I I get I give you win. <laughs> I'm t I'm sick of banging my head up against the wall. Thank you. You know I'm I'm fine. Yeah. I don't, I have all this to fall back on, you know, all this back here. Oh, that that's incredible. I thought it was a virtual background at first. No, no, this Looks... is this is a, a show I did with Elaine Boosler for an American Cancer Society. This is wow. a production of one of my plays. Uh, this is uh, I wrote for Shoe, the um, the comic strip Shoe. This is one mm -hmm. of my, uh, this is the 
the uh, billboard at Caesar's Palace with my name on it. Um, this is Who's Who. This is another show I did. Um, this is um, this is a production from Delaware of uh, oh, what the hell was the name of that play? It's a, I can't remember the name of my own play. Anyway, that's a production of one of my plays. So that's my, this is the memory wall. Oh, when the nice. fire breaks out, this is the stuff you grab first. <laughs> as you can see this is my memory wall too because it's very blank and i've got nothing except <laughs> oh, you, have you have coming coming attractions <laughs> coming soon an accomplishment coming by soon. stefan credits. credits coming soon what the hell is it <laughs> oh rest in pieces rest in peace how could i forget rest in pieces uh, I, I, <laughs> oh i had the best i had the best experience of my life in the uh, the Del theater in Delaware, the Delaware Theater Company, the most professional, wonderful group of really? people I, I ever worked with. And Donna Pescow was the star uh, from um, Saturday Night Fever. And she and I have become like really good friends. And so it was, it was worth, you know, it was, it was the most wonderful experience of my life, that particular production. Oh there, my gosh. There were other productions not so fun fun. <laughs> I I was gonna ask just because I, I know you've mentioned that you stand up, also have written for TV shows, plays, movies, the whole the whole gamut of entertainment. And where did the writing start? Did it start when you wanted to be a singer? Were you writing songs or were you writing before that? You know where it started? There's this woman in, in, in uh, Los Angeles by the name of Carol Gordon Mora. Carol Mora was married to Buddy Mora. Buddy mm -hmm. Mora was Robin Williams, uh, Robert Klein, uh, uh, Billy Crystal's manager, along with wow. every, other, every other huge comedian. Well, she had a class, a writing class. And when I had, when I had finished my last TV show mm -hmm. and I was sitting around the house, Mary Willard, God rest her soul, uh, called me, she said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing, I'm looking for something to do. She said, you ought to join Carol Moore's writing class. And that's what I did. I thought, oh, what a great idea, a workshop. And I, I was in that workshop for 20 years before I left LA. <clears throat> and wow. Rest in Pieces was written in there. Uh, this one uh, was written there. My books were written there. And it's just a, a safe place where you get criticized, but with love, you know, so it, it's an encouraging space, and that's exactly what I needed. Uh, and you know, I, I adore Carol. Carol's like family now. Oh, that's so cool. And, and I've been, as I've been talking with writers, it seems like a group or people in a safe space with people you trust that can give you constructive criticism and things like that is really important as you're creating these well, masterpieces. They're beautiful. It's pieces. important because unless you're not in with a group of egomaniacs who, uh, you know, because I've written on shows where seven yeah. writers sit around a room and fight for four hours over one joke. And what they're, right, they're fighting for is to get their joke in the script. Now that's not funny, this is funny. You know, that can uh, be a nightmare. You know, I, I had that happen one day. I, it was, I was writing for Norman Lear and mm -hmm. I was in a room with about six writers and we literally were stuck on one joke for six hours. And I said, I said, would you excuse me for a minute? And I went up to the office, I went up to my office. I wrote 30 jokes on a, on a piece of paper. I went back to the office, I threw it on the table and I said, pick a goddamn joke and let's go home. Oh my God. 
you know, it, because everybody's everybody's ego wants to get their stuff in the script. Yeah, that's got to be. It's really interesting too when you tear apart comedy and you're building and making jokes and then trying to run them by people. It's hard enough if it's just missing that one little thing. Well, also, but if then you, if you say ahead. the joke eleven times, by the eleventh time, nobody thinks it's funny anymore. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's that it's that element of exactly. surprise for the first time that gets the laugh. But if you keep going over it and over it and over it and over it, nobody laughs. As a matter of fact, on the Cher, yeah. Sonny and Cher, Cher show, when they were running cameras, you know, camera blocking, and they mm -hmm. were running the script, they would go blah, 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 blah. And then I walked in and blah, 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 because they didn't want to give the punchlines to the crew so that they would get the laugh from the crew as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's a That's because you can't you, you can hear a song 12 times, but you can only hear a joke once or twice. Yes, exactly. I think you nailed it with that surprise being that crucial element for the laugh cuz once you know You want to hear my favorite joke? It was just told to yes. me a year ago. Woman walks into woman walks into a, a pharmacy and she says to the pharmacist, "I I want cyanide to kill my husband. And the pharmacist says, I can't give you cyanide to kill your husband. She reaches into her purse and she pulls out a photo and she hands the photo to the pharmacist and she says, that's my husband with your wife. And the pharmacist says, well, you didn't tell me you had a prescription. <laughs> That's <laughs> that, that is, is a great joke. That's my favorite new joke. <laughs> that is amazing. Did yeah. you did you write that? No. Roberta okay. Kent gave me that joke. She called me up and she said, Do you want to hear the best joke? And I said, sure. And she she uh she told me and I, I howled and I laugh at nothing. You know, I laugh at nothing. As a matter of I, I have the most inappropriate sense of humor because I, I was at a funeral of, of a friend's father and <laughs> this guy's father was like my father I mean he was I love this man mm. and he was in the army so they had a color guard and they had an American flag and they were folding the American flag they're folding it folding it and it took them 20 minutes to fold the the flag and the you know and I just said to no one, that's how I fold my sheets. And the whole place broke up. <laughs> and and, and, uh, and the, the, my friend Stephen, it was his name is also Stephen, turned to me and went, uh -huh. Blue Sky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And I had heard somewhere that you all you like to take those dark maybe macabre or or um kind of dark moments and make humor out of it which i think yeah, is really cool that's what all my plays i have a play about death i have a play about suicide i have a play about alzheimer's i have a play about cancer i have a play and they're all comedies i love to take dark subjects and treat them like my book take my prostate please please that is that's a book about prostate cancer. And all I did was I, I had I had gone through that. And all I did was I got home every night after I would go to whatever I had to do that day. And I would just chronicle what happened that day. And it turns out it would turns out to be very funny because I just see the world different than most people. You know. That's so funny. And and I think it takes such skill. It takes skill to write comedy and be funny in general, but then also taking such dark moments that a lot of people, when they first hear about death, cancer, anything like that, they, they, it can trigger a, a negative emotion for them right. and to right. be able to flip it and make it funny is leveling up from just the wanna, ordinary stuff. You want to know the truth. Writing comedy is the easiest thing I do. Truly, walking into a room full of strangers, that's hell. But sitting down and writing comedy is, it, it's second nature. And here's an, 
here's an interesting story I'm going to tell you. I have, <laughs> Please. I have a Russian, as opposed to all this crap I've been talking about. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, I have a Russian travel agent. And okay. so I said to him, you know, my whole family was from the USSR. And he said, where? I said, well, Odessa. And he said to me, well, then you must have a good sense of humor. I said, what are you talking about? He said, Odessans are known for their sense of humor. And there's a hmm. comedy festival that goes back centuries that started in Odessa. And I said, well, do you know what I do for a living? And he said, no. And I told him and he said, well, that makes perfect sense. And the funny thing is the Blue Stein side of my family, the Blue Stein side, we all have the same sense of humor. My cousin Bobby, my cousin Didi, my aunt Edie, my uncle, my, uh, my cousin Didi, did I say Didi? We all oh. have that same sense of humor. It's really hilarious. I'm the only one that, you know, went in as a, as a uh, uh, career. That cashed in on that sense of humor. Yeah, I cashed yeah. in. My father, oh, my father had the same sense of humor. My father could do voices. He could, you know, huh. he, yeah, he was, it was really, but he, he worked with my uncle. You know, no one, actually my father, you know, the comedian Ben Blue, Ben Blue, the, he was an old, from the 40s, he, hmm. he recognized my father's talent and wanted to take my father on the road. But wow. my, my grandfather said no. And so hmm. that was actually the model I used when my mother was so against my being in show business. I said, you know, I can either go after my dream or end up working in a stationery store, which is what my father did. And I decided I was going to go after my dream. And, you know, and my mother was a bitch. She just, she truly was. In 35 years, she never came to a single show, not one. Oh, I said, man. I said to a friend, uh, what did he write a book for? Nobody cares about his life. Literally. So. What? I know, I know. So uh, that's what the Point of Pines really deals with that a lot. You know, how that negativity was uh, funneled and how I, how I lived with it, and what happened to me because of it. So, um, and the funny thing is, even though I'm living in this mansion, you know, this, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm okay. I still feel like I'm not successful on the inside. And that's, that's really? what, yeah, that's what, um, you know, that's my, my message to any parent who has a child out there who wants to go into the arts. You have to support them. You know, you have to support them. You know, my, my mother said to me once, I just don't find you funny. You know, it's, yeah. I said, well, that's funny. because wow. The whole world does. She says, well, I don't. Oh my gosh. I know. And that was, yeah, she was, she was a narcissist, I'm learning. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, and it's not, as a matter of fact, one psychiatrist told me that I had to get the book, The Narcissist, The Narcissistic Mother and the and the child, or something like that. And I, and so I bought the book and I went and I said, hey, I'm on every page here. She says, yeah, I know. That's why I want you to read. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. All right, we didn't have to talk. Wow. Well, no, 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 it's it's very interesting. And and um, I, I'm sorry if it brought up some bad feelings for you, but oh, I- it's fine, it's just it, fine. <laughs> It, it just made me think of of my parents and and how important how big no, of an it's impact fine. Parents. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> oh my gosh. We might make that the promo of the episode. Yeah. That'll be great. But um uh, no, I, I might the hairless comic. Yeah, maybe <laughs> I go over here. Here, you know, I should be sitting uh, here. That's where I should be sitting. Or maybe here. There. That's where I should have sat. Damn. Wait, no, yeah. I, you were good in the center. 
All right. You know, do you, are you watching CNN? Not CNN, uh, MSNBC? Everybody's got a bookcase behind them. Everybody's got a bookcase. There must be a, there must be, uh, there must be a concession where they're buying bookcases for people on CNN and MSNBC. And there's always a flower pot here and a flower pot here and a bookcase. Oh my, you know what? Maybe it's like police instead of a gun and badge, you get a flower pot and a bookcase. So when well, you have yeah. to retire, you gotta. Um, so what does your wife do? Does she work? My wife, she does work. Yes, she also works. Um, at, she works at Amazon. So she's a business consultant. Yes. Uh, an Amazon consultant? She is. That's a tough job. Yeah, go ahead, buy that. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think we should buy that. Yeah, I, you know, between Amazon and the Bank of America, now you can you can deposit checks on your iPhone. Between those uh -huh. two things, I never have to leave the house again as long as I live ever again. It's the, one day I was looking for a particular battery, a small battery for the remotes. I have awnings that come out, you know, because it's the desert and they're remote control. And I couldn't yes. find the battery. And I was at like one, two, three, four store. I was in the fourth store and I said, wait a minute. I took out my iPhone. I looked on Amazon. There was the battery. Buy. And it was, in, excuse me, it was in the house the next day. Oh, I am so man. addicted to, I have personally made Jeff Be Bezos a multi-billionaire. It's me. I, it's me. <laughs> you can blame me. I, I you should. I, it's like an addiction, Amazon. It really I, is. No, I, I know. It's so, and it's so easy to to buy. You can buy it with one click. I've bought three things since we've been on the podcast. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just they they have made it so simple. And, and then I, if you don't like it, you know what? And if you don't like it, or it comes damaged, there's no problem. You just return it. There's. I've had stuff. I, I got I got something. I ordered one. They sent two, and it was my fault. I clicked it twice, and they said, oh, "Just keep it." I said, "Really?" I, I said, yeah, just keep it. It cost them sixteen cents to make it. it cost them three dollars to return it. So they, <laughs> but that's a business model. That's a business model where you have returned customers over and over. It, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Yes. Yes, you know? exactly. And we're going to take a quick sponsor break from our sponsor, Amazon, real quick. Amazon. No. Uh, they, they are great. They really are great. Um, and I'll, I'll have a link in the show notes if you want to go and buy something, get a commission from us. That's great. Well, no, you can, get my, you can buy my books on Amazon. That's right. Yes, exactly. If Steve you, Bluestein's you know, books. If go you ahead. put my, my name on Amazon, I was, I was shocked at how much stuff came up. Because over the years, you know, I did videos, I did talk shows, I did stuff. Well, they're all for sale. And there, and there I am. I don't want any of it, but I, you know, but I, I do want to sell my books. Oh, so, nice. Sell my are, books. Are, are you on Barnes and Noble as well? I was on, two of the books are on Barnes and Noble. But then uh, my agent had a nervous breakdown and dropped all our clients. So, uh, so I'm. No. I, the last book is is self published. Oh, I think you can still. I used to work at Barnes and Noble at the corporate office in New York, and they they have the Barnes and Noble publisher where you can also self publish there. So. Oh really? Well, well, we should talk. Well, I've already self published on. Uh, on iTunes, I did it on iTunes. Oh, okay, okay. I'm wondering that if they're really easy. That you know, the the they sell the books and they direct deposit into my into my checking account. I, I I'm telling you, I never have to leave the house again. I have a brand new Tesla. I have a brand new Tesla, right? It's two years old. It has oh. forty two hundred miles on it. I never leave the house. <laughs> never leave the house. Oh, but do you get notifications from the Tesla? Like an ex-girlfriend? Hey, you around? 
You want to no, drive me, please? Like, we're updating. We're updating the software, and so they update it, and you know, suddenly I have a coffee maker in the car. I don't, you know, it's. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I love the car. I absolutely love the car. I love the car because, first of all, I'm very. I have solar on my house, and so be, it costs me nothing to charge the car up, but. Um, I love the car because it is the best pickup on any car I've ever driven. You know, the first time I got on the freeway, I hit, I put my foot on the gas and I was thrown back in the seat and I went, holy crap. And, <laughs> and I have the, you know, I have the, the pilot, the automatic pilot. Oh yeah, the autopilot. I was, I was living in LA and I had a place here in Palm Springs. I would drive two and a half hours. I would just put the address in, hit the button and keep, you have to keep your hands on the steering wheel. And I wouldn't have to do anything. And a couple of times it saved my life. Wow. Because there, uh, uh, one time I was driving about, you know, you're doing 80 miles an hour uh, on the freeway and I was driving this way. And suddenly I look over and there's a car perpendicular on the freeway, literally perpendicular to me. And my oh car my God. automatically swerved away to, without me touching it. It was amazing. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, Elon, that's a... baby, I love you, Elon. <laughs> <laughs> and I bought the stock. I bought the stock. I bought really? the stock. Really? Yeah. And I, like two days ago, it was up fifty-six dollars a share. Yesterday it was up. Yesterday it was down twenty dollars. Today it was up thirty dollars a share. It's an amazing stock. It, even my broker. Wow. Goes, what the hell? <laughs> He's never seen anything like it. Jeez, that's crazy. I know it made its debut into the S&P 500 a little uh, that while day, ago. That day went through the roof. You know, it was like, oh my God. I, just knew, I just knew that if I loved my car this much, that there must be millions of people who love their cars as much as I do. And I was right, you know. So, <laughs> so take that's that. That's amazing. <laughs> take that. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Amazing. Now we're going to get into the advice portion of the podcast, Steve. I Tell wanted yourself. to, a <laughs> I was going to ask if you were good advice. Sounds like you're great. So this is perfect. What, 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 what advice for what? So we have fans that send in questions that people have asked on the internet and um, you'll see they're not too serious. They're kind of silly. So We'll ask you. We can answer very seriously or very silliously. Up to you. Hey, it's your episode. Do you edit this? Yeah. All right. I have to blow my nose. Oh, please. Yes. Go ahead. You know, there's years of cocaine use. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so we're gonna get into the advice. First, I like to I like to ask my guests because I like to get inspired before we give advice. Do you have any inspirational quotes, Steve, that you often think back on when you're in when you're feeling down? Right or wrong, make a decision. How do you like oh, that? I love that. I made a decision to love that because that is, it speaks to me. Whenever I'm overthinking something, I'm like, God, if I had made a decision by now, I would be five miles ahead. And that was taught to me by an uncle who I detested. He was a total piece of shit in my life. I hated the man. As a matter of fact, he's dead. I still hate him. But he taught me that one thing, huh. right or wrong, make a decision. And it's, so true, because if you're wrong, you learn from your mistakes. And if you're right, you learn that you, you gain self-confidence knowing that you can make a proper decision. But if you vacillate, you never learn, you, you never learn anything. So that's my quote. That's a, that's a great quote. And you know what? I know that story you were telling when you were in the writer's room and nobody could make a decision. You went up made right. three jokes put them exactly. down that's exactly right yeah. 
and in, you know, when I'm going out to shop, when I'm shopping, if I put on a shirt and I look at it and I say, will I wear it? Do I like it? Is it, does it fit? Then I know it's wrong. Because if I put on a shirt, I got, love it, look, so. Oh, St Steve, you're speaking my language here. I am the same, I used to be, oh, I like this kind of, and I'll take it and then I'll never wear it. So now right. it's like, if I don't love it when it's on, I'm not buying it. I'm well, that's the thing. If I have, if I'm standing in the front of a mirror going, do I like it? Will I wear it? You know, I mean, uh, and then I, then it suddenly hits me. No, you didn't instantly like it. So that means you'll never wear it. Put it back on the rack. I mean, I've got no. shelves of clothes that I never wear because of that. And I'm oh selling gosh. those clothes at a discount. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love it. All right. Well, that's a beautiful quote. I actually, I've got a quote too, but it's not by any person. It's actually by a robot and it's called Inspirobot. So what it does is it uses AI to take some of the wisest words known to man and just mash them together for a beautiful inspirational quote. What, what is your it? thoughts so far? Are you ready to hear it? It says, if you can kidnap him, you can ask him. That's wow. the quote. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you got a robot that tells you to kidnap people? <laughs> Your Honor, I was just following what the robot said. <laughs> oh, my God. I know. <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> If you can kidnap him, that's the quote? Come on. Is there another quote? Try another one. If you can. All right. Take the chance. No, go ahead. <laughs> if you go, so I'll put this in the show notes too. If you go to inspirobot.me, it generates a quote on the spot. All right. Um, here's a quote that I just, just popped up. A lawyer is a boyfriend with lipstick. So what are you going to do about it? You know what? I would take, I would take this site off, off your, off your podcast. That's, that's not even a sentence. What are you talking? About? A lawyer is a, a lawyer is a what is it? A lawyer is a thing with lipstick. A lawyer is a boyfriend with lipstick. So what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> You've just called every lawyer in America gay. <laughs> every male. <laughs> Inspirebot, it, yes. I uh, will have to do some modifications, maybe. Yeah, on right. That, so. All right. So, where are the questions from the people? Because the robot's not doing to it. All right. Yes. Now that we're nice and inspired, we're going right. to move on to the questions from the people. Okay. So, this was found on Reddit.com in the advice section. It says, So, how do I ask my boyfriend for a promise ring? My boyfriend and I are both 20 years old and have been together for six years. He's the absolute love of my life. And I absolutely can't wait to spend the rest of my life with him. The thing is, I've always dreamed of having a promise ring before an engagement ring. I fantasized about it since before I was in middle school. I don't know how to ask without sounding conceited or like I'm trying to force him to propose. What okay. can I say or do to get my point across? Right. Here's my advice. It's not for her. It's for him. Run. This woman is a lunatic. <laughs> Seriously, since she was in middle if school? Have, if you have to ask for a ring, you're screwed already. <laughs> <laughs> I've never understood promise rings anyway. I yeah. think that was, that's what an engagement ring is. It, maybe she's, you know, maybe she's from Iowa. You know, they don't, and they don't have... Uh, they call it promise rings. Yeah, I promise to get, here's a ring I promise to get you a ring with. What? Yeah, it's like, I promise to promise to marry you. Yeah, no, that's, is... no, this girl is, this girl has big problems. Okay, so run, run, run. for the guy. Run for the guy, yeah. Oh, I like it. Okay, this next one is, how do I turn down my boss wanting to go to lunch? Nice short one. Throw up in his office. Oh. <laughs> That'll stop it. 
that is a pretty good piece of advice, actually. If you did that. (laughs) (laughs) Never mind. I'll go by myself. Thanks. I love it. I love it. All right. This uh, this last question. All right. Is damaged my best friend's laptop on her birthday. I accidentally spilled a bit of drink on the laptop that she uses for online classes while I was cleaning up. I didn't tell her about it. Now she has to pay for a new motherboard. Should I tell her? Of course you should tell her, you piece of shit. What? What? <laughs> What kind of friend are you? Hey, I killed your cat, but I'm not going to tell you. No, if you do something, <laughs> if you do something like that to someone, then you must tell them. This this girl needs a new friend. I know this girl should go with Agreed. the guy with the crazy girl with the crazy girlfriend. <laughs> These two are made for each other. That, give the crazy give girl, give the give this girl the the guy's number because they're made for each other. Oh, that's beautiful. And then they can get each other a nice promise ring. Hopefully no one breaks it because then you'll never the figure money out. They pay from not buying a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, now that we're all advised out, Steve, I just wanted to give you a huge thank you for coming on the pod, talking about yourself and giving some advice. Hey, it's, it was, I actually had a great time. You know, and I fell asleep. Oh, good. I fell asleep at 3.30, my time. And I woke up like I was, that's why I'm drinking coffee because I, I'm one of those people, some people take a nap and they wake up refreshed. I wake up like a corpse, you know, it's like, oh, no. I can't, <laughs> I, had to, I had to wake up bad. But before we go, we must tell everyone that my new book is called Point of Pines and it's available on amazon.com, Kindle and uh, iTunes and my other book. Well, if you go to my website, stevebluestein.biz forward slash books, stevebluestein.biz forward slash books, there's a page. Click on the book you want, and it'll just take you to where you can get it. That's beautiful. And they won't even have to type it in because it's going to be in the show notes, so they can just go there and click when they hear the Perfect. episode. Perfect. And they go right so there. How many viewers do you have? Seven. <laughs> um, I've got mom, dad, and my brothers. So and three. You have me. So that's four. How many brothers do you have? I have two brothers and two sisters. Wow, Catholic. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. That's funny. See, I'm an only child, and you know what? Who Who did I learn was an only child? And I just said, well, that makes perfect sense. You know, only children are special people. You could put me in solitary confinement for 35 years. I'd be fine. <laughs> I'd find bugs. I'd play with them. You know, I'd color on the walls. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I self-entertain myself. I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't do well in groups. And uh-huh. somebody told me, oh, 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 Sal Mastretta, who's a Broadway actor, friend of mine. Sal Mastretta. Uh-huh is an only child, makes perfect sense. He makes perfect sense. I've seen him in a group of people and he's just in his own little world. (laughs) (laughs) That's so funny. Meanwhile, I'm creating a podcast just for the excuse to talk with people. So I, uh, (laughs) no, I had it it beforehand, but my, I actually had it with two of my brothers, my two brothers, and then they stopped because they were bored and uh, sick of me. That's why. (laughs) <laughs> you, know, you know what I always say? Now, you, you seem pretty normal. But when I say, when a Jew goes bad, you can always fix them. But when a Catholic goes bad, they go bad in ways I have never seen in my life. They, they are so <laughs> crazy. Things like, they do things like, I just sit and go, what? <laughs> I said, I'm crazy. <laughs> And I've never done shit like that before. <laughs> oh my God. That is very accurate. I think I've been, I've gone a little bad, but nothing crazy, but oh, I've had some there, friends. There's some Catholic people, Catholic guilt. There's nothing. I thought Jewish guilt was bad. That's, that's a piece of cake compared to Catholic guilt. 
Oh my God. I know. I mean, we have, I remember growing up, we had the crucifixes everywhere. So we've got a constant reminder of some guy dying, hanging on a cross and saying, I died for you. So you better be good. Right. And we killed him and we don't even care. <laughs> God, I'd be like, if, if I had a, a Jesus eating a cheeseburger above the door, that'd be a nice reminder of like, Hey, good guy. God. <coughs> Yeah. Anyway, anyway, oh, well, thank right. you again That's so much, Steve. An American that hates me now. Um, no, it's it. Listen, I've really enjoyed this, and and uh, you yeah, call me up anytime. I'd be happy to come back. Oh, thank you so much, and you're welcome back anytime. I may, you know, a couple months a year, we'll have the reunion, yeah, and we'll lovely. chat again. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Steve. And uh, I hope you have a good rest of your evening. You too. Wait a minute. Alexa's talking. What is it, Ale Alexa? Do you have a message? Yeah. No message. It's your Tesla. Please drive me. Right. <laughs> Lit, dear. Um, yeah, the Tesla, Tesla called me. Don't you love me anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Please come back. Oh. Please come back. Other people are driving their cars. Why? Don't you <laughs> oh well, Steve, this was an absolute blast. Thank you again. This thanks for it. thanks for having me. Take care. Awesome. You too. Bye bye. bye.